Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. For me, he died. For me, he lives. And everlasting life and light he freely gives. It's wonderful to know, isn't it, that our Lord Jesus Christ has provided everything that we could possibly ever need in all of eternity. Take out your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 19. Tonight we're looking at verses 11 through 20 and hopefully being able to answer the question, can we cast out demons? Now, I know I'm not going to get through all these notes tonight because I have 22 pages of notes. <laughs> so I suspect that we will have to come back and revisit this subject next week again. But um, Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, I just want to do a very, very brief overview of what we covered last week because it is essential for our understanding of what happens tonight in our text. Beginning in verse 8, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not and spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Fascinating passage because he's doing what appears to be carnal battle in verses 8 through 10, and then we see spiritual battle in verses 11 through 20, which we'll be looking at in a few minutes. But we noted last week that what is taking place here in verses 8 through 10 is something that every evangelist, pastor, and preacher has to face at some time during his ministry. We have to deal with people who have hardened hearts to the preaching of the Word of God. Satan designs that to try to discourage men to leave ministry, and he has succeeded in doing that in many cases over the centuries. On Sunday morning, we've seen the incredible hardness of the heart of Pharaoh, even after God gave him multiple opportunities to repent, and he refused to do so. We see that people responded to our Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul with hardened hearts. Many different occasions where we looked at, people responded to the message of those who followed the apostles, and even down to today with hardened hearts and cruel rejection. And what we learned was we shouldn't take it personally, although that's easy to do. When people reject the word of the Lord, they are not rejecting you, they are rejecting the word of God. We saw that there are serious consequences for rejecting the word of God spoken by his servants, and it is easy to take it personally. We looked at some illustrations, you recall, out of the life of Samuel, where the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, came to Samuel and to Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. <laughs> what an indictment. We all get old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. And, of course, they knew that God could solve that problem because God had solved that problem with Samuel. Eli had had sons that were wicked sons who did not walk in the ways of God, and God raised up Samuel the people didn't have to come up with their own plan. And so they decided, well, if that's the case, if that's the way that it's going to be, then now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted to be like the world. How easy it is for believers to decide that because things aren't going the way that they had anticipated, the way that they planned, the way that they thought God was going to work, that then it's okay to be like the world. All around us, we see people are like that. The church is like that. The American church has said, well, you know, we don't see the people flocking in. We, we don't have these, uh, uh, these great massive revivals like during the Great Awakening or the Second Great Awakening. We don't see people coming to Christ like during the great evangelistic crusades of the 19th century and the 20th century. Therefore, we must go the way of the world. And so they bring in their rock music and their strobe lights and their wiggling bodies dancing on the stage and all kinds of other worldly entertainment. And as one young couple once said to me about a church where they had attended and decided not to attend anymore, they had brought someone to a banquet at that other church, and the featured attraction was a belly dancer, and the unsaved friend said to them, this is better than a nightclub. <laughs> Folks, you don't have to go the way of the world. We know that we're living in the last days. We know there's a great apostasy, a great falling away. We, we know that as the time approaches, the Lord Jesus Christ said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? 
You don't have to go the ways of the world. God can solve the problems. But Israel didn't understand that, and so there are serious consequences for rejecting the word of God spoken by his servant, and we saw that those consequences were both for the nation of Israel, because the nation of Israel had, from that point on, almost all bad kings. The southern kingdom had a few good kings. The northern kingdom had no good kings at all. Samuel told them the consequences, you recall. They wouldn't listen. He told them what kind of king they would get, even if they got the very best in terms of human kings, and Saul was the very best. But they decided not to listen. We saw that God uses a very important principle, which is stated clearly for us in Psalm 106. When people choose to do their own thing instead of doing what God has told them to do. Psalm 106, verse 15. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. How better to have fullness in your soul from God than getting your own personal requests, which you think are going to satisfy you. The accumulation of money, the accumulation of fame and wealth, the accumulation of all kinds of personal pleasures, but have leanness in your soul. Very serious issues. God gives consequences in the lives of individuals as well as nations when they reject his word. We saw that also with illustrated in the life of Saul where God jerked the kingdom away from him when he disobeyed God. And then with that narrative in mind, we saw the contrasting grace and perhaps the humor of God because there was an Old Testament Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, biggest man in all of Israel, young, strong, handsome. But there was also another man named Saul from the tribe of Benjamin who was small and ugly, and he got his name changed from Saul to Paul, which means that little guy. Wasn't big, he was little. And he's given that name in Acts chapter 13, verse 9. From that point on, he's known as Paul throughout all the rest of the New Testament. It was also in Acts 13 that Paul, actually, in his sermon at Antioch of Pisidia, mentioned the Saul of the Old Testament. Last time he's mentioned. <laughs> God was setting a contrast for us, a humorous contrast, but a contrast that makes a difference if you understand what God is saying in that passage. People were not impressed by Paul. He was ugly and contemptible. It says so in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, 11.29, 12.10. We read those passages last week. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that he was not an impressive individual. And that we closed with was how it gives all of us hope for being useful in the service of Christ. Because none of us are very impressive. I mean, we can search the roles of this congregation and none of us are impressive. We simply aren't. But that gives us hope. And Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 1, 27. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's us. Those who are weak, those who are contemptible, those who are foolish. And God gave Paul that encouragement in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And that's the background for our passage tonight, which is verses 11 and following. It says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And I'm going to pause and just make a brief comment here at this point. We'll not develop it tonight. But you see the same type of thing being picked up and trying to be used as a fetish, both in the Masonic Lodge and in Mormonism. Now, if you want to know more about that in relation to Mormonism, be sure to listen to the live broadcasts when I talk down at the Dean Bergen Society about Mormonism versus the King James Bible. So from his body were brought under the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. So they got the right Jesus. They're using the right words. They're not talking about the Christ of the cults or the Christ that's described as one of the many gods of uh, Hinduism 
or the Christ of Islam, who is merely a prophet, and Muhammad's a greater prophet, they don't have the wrong Christ. They got the right Christ. We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, oh, I think they were probably a little bit taken by surprise. Here's what the spirit said. Jesus, I know. Yeah, I know who that is. And Paul, I know. But who are ye? <laughs> hmm. Folks, be very careful what you do. You might have the right words, but if you don't have the authority, you are in serious trouble. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. Remember, seven to one. Pretty good odds, right? Hey, seven tough young men. In fact, from a religious household. They're from a priestly family. They've apparently been doing this kind of thing for a period of time, and now they say, hey, look, here's another magic incantation that we can add to our formulas for, for our um, casting out demons, sort of like Roman Catholic priests do, you know, come and cleanse a house of demons. The evil spirit leaped on them, overcame them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Demon made sure that not one of those seven got out of the house without being completely stripped of his clothing. Now, I think that might be rather embarrassing to go running out of a house into general public without any of your clothes on. The demon did it to him. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. You know, God uses those things that are evil for his glory and our good. Romans 8, 28 is still in the book, and we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them we're the called according to his purpose. Because we're going to see that there was some compromise going on with people who were still dabbling in the occult, that God used this to let them understand it's not something that you play with. Look at the next verse. It was known unto all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. We're talking about people who had believed. People who believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it, 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. There's some serious stuff here in this passage. I hope you picked up on that. There were people who were so, so committed. They're believed. But they were still fiddling around with stuff that they should never have been involved in. When they saw what happened to those seven, and those seven apparently were well known, and they were religious, and, and, and they were the sons of the chief of the priests. They're not some lower class down here. And you remember, Paul has been in the synagogue, and Paul preached, and the people hardened their hearts in just a few verses before this. So he went and disputed in the school of Tyrannus. The chief of the priests means that they were the sons of one of the main rulers of the synagogue where Paul had preached. They said, you know, we don't like the conclusions that Paul's coming to, but it's clear that he's doing something miraculous. And since he's doing something miraculous, hey, why don't we get in on the act? Now, let, let's pay attention to what Paul's doing. They probably sat there and watched Paul and listened as he said various things, and they saw when these napkins and things went out, and they thought, you know, we can probably get in on this. 
Paul's preaching Jesus. We'll talk about the Jesus that Paul preaches. Got the right one. And so we can make a few bucks off of this. Apostates always try to make a few bucks off religion. It's clear that the devil's people are definitely making a few bucks off of their religion. But when this happened to those seven men, everybody knew about it, not just the Jews, but it says the Greeks dwelling at Ephesus. You see, Paul's been preaching in the in the school of one Tyrannus for two full years. Not only Jews are hearing Christ, but the Gentiles are hearing Christ. But the Gentiles are also aware of the subculture going on. The subculture where there is supernatural, where there are demonic manifestations, where there is power available for those who are willing to make certain kinds of compromises. But when they see a clear manifestation of what happens to people who try to dabble with it, there is some conviction. Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. The next part is really fascinating to me. Ever tried to hold hands with Jesus and the devil at the same time? Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, churches used to have book and record burnings. Quite appropriate when you look at some of the stuff that they were burning. They were burning Beatles records and they were burning all kinds of other stuff along that line. They are burning these records that were back masked, where if you put the needle on the record and then you spun it in reverse, it actually had words like Satan and things like that on them, and various phrases, which I will not repeat. They burned them. What do you have in your house that ought to be burned? What kind of occultic objects or pagan gods that you think are nice little figurines sitting around and looking cool? Do you have any mementos that have been involved in the occult or black magic, safe from mission trips? You say, but it's worth something. I paid money for that. Books that might perhaps be involved in the dabbling of the black arts. But it costs a lot of money, or I inherited it, or whatever excuse you want to use. It says 50,000 pieces of silver. Somebody was sitting there writing down what was getting burned, and they counted it up. And it was worth 50,000 pieces of silver, not 50,000 pieces of paper, like if you had 50,000 $1 bills. How many of you would like to have 50,000 $1 bills right now in your suitcase right next to you? <laughs> Everybody out there raising their hand, right? <laughs> pieces of silver. Dollars used to be silver certificates. You could turn them in for silver. You can't anymore. They're Federal Reserve notes now. 50,000 pieces of silver. It's a lot of money, folks. Would you rather lose your money and be in fellowship with God than hang on to your money and be in fellowship with the devil? There's some very practical lessons here in this text tonight. So now as we move into an, an analysis of the text, we're going to make a contrast with what we saw last week back in verses 8 through 10 and what we see here this week in verses 11 through 20. The first thing we notice is there's carnal opposition in verses 8 through 10. But the carnal opposition didn't stop Paul. 
Paul just kept right on cranking along. Hard hearts and hanging on. That was the message last week. Paul ran into hard hearts. Many preachers are discouraged when they run into hard hearts. Hey, it's par for the course. But when that didn't stop Paul, the opposition ratchets up a notch and we're involved now in demonic warfare here in these next 11 verses. God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Not just physical healings going on here. We find the Apostle Paul is involved in spiritual warfare with demonic forces in verse 12. We also see a ratcheting up of the Apostle Paul's exercise of his supernatural apostolic gifts. Three different things are mentioned here in the passage. Did you note them? It says special miracles. That's the first thing. We'll talk about that in a second. The second thing, there are healings going on. Diseases departed from them. The third thing that's happening in the passage is there's a casting out of demons. Evil spirits went out of them. Now, let me just stop for a moment and talk about the handkerchiefs and the aprons. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But we know that God sometimes uses an instrument in the hand of one of his servants to accomplish the miraculous. And we've seen, of course, many, many illustrations of that with the rod of Moses, with the rod of Aaron in our studies in the book of Exodus. But remember also that not all miracles are healings. For example, one of the miracles that Paul performs earlier is when he smites Elymas the sorcerer with blindness. That's not a healing, but it is a miracle. Here in this passage in Acts, there's also one subcategory under healings, the use of secondary physical items to produce the healings. Let me point out one other thing. That's something that even certain Old Testament prophets used on occasions, but sometimes without success. Did you know that? There's one very famous prophet in the Old Testament who tried to use an instrumentality to perform a healing and it didn't work. Can you think of it? Well, as soon as I start reading the passage, you'll recognize it. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set up for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, he's not talking to her directly, he's telling, <laughs> you know, she's standing there. He says to Gehazi, you talk to her. That's an insult, isn't it, to your hostess? Uh, say now to her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. There's that problem of being old again. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said unto her, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at the season that Elijah had said unto her, According to the time of life, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It's neither the new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass that the man of God saw her afar off, that she said, he said unto Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, 
It is well. When she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. It's kind of surprised. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins. And take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if he salute thee, answer him not again. And lay my staff on the face of the child. He's trying to use an instrumentality. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Gehazi passed on before them, and he laid the staff on the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awakened. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went out and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. Even Elisha, who had a double portion of the blessing that Elijah had, wasn't able to use an instrumentality in that case. And yet we see the Apostle Paul, as we get to the New Testament, where there's a greater manifestation of the spiritual gifts and powers and abilities. And we've talked about in the past a great deal the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament, where the Spirit of God came on people, empowered them in certain very supernatural ways in the Old Testament, but the Spirit could also leave them. That's why David prays, Lord, take not thy spirit from me. And the New Testament, where the Holy Spirit comes on people and indwells them permanently, and gave the 22 different spiritual gifts, seven of which were temporary to the apostolic period. We've talked about that in detail. And 14 of which are still available today. And the Holy Spirit never departs from us. He permanently indwells us. A contrast. So perhaps you remember our studies in the spiritual gifts when we looked at what Stephen, for example, was doing in Acts chapter 8. We see exactly the same thing going on in Acts chapter 8 that is going on in Acts chapter 19 where we are tonight. There was also demonic activity that manifested itself there as well. Beginning in verse 5 of chapter 8, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. They heard him preach and they saw his miracles. The miracles confirmed what Stephen was preaching. For unclean spirits, now that's a very important phrase. We're going to see some of that tonight. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame. So we see casting out of demons, and we also see healings, which is what's going on with the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19 and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Now, you know, that's the same temptation that the seven sons of Sceva have, and which they try to pull off over in Acts chapter 19. It's a temptation, folks, to be known, to be powerful, to be famous, to be rich. Simon at the end offers money so that he can do the same thing, gets rebuked for it. All those different temptations of the flesh when there is supernatural involved. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because of that a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and that's what's going on there in Ephesus as well. 
and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 8 is one of those turning points where you find moving from just Jewish men to people who are half Jewish and half Gentile and both men and women. Acts chapter 2 is Jewish men. Acts chapter 8 is men and women. And somebody who is born Gentile and yet converts to Judaism and is neither male nor female, the Ethiopian eunuch at the end of Acts chapter 8. Then Simon himself believed also. Now there's no question that Simon was a believer. There's no question that the people in Acts chapter 19 are believers. It says so. But they were tempted with stuff that God said no to. Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he not only believed, but he made an open profession of faith. Then say he was baptized as a baby here. It's after he believed. Perfectly okay, folks. We baptize infants and children on a different basis. But here's a believer, and so he makes a public profession of faith. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He's carefully examining what's going on. The people there at Ephesus were examining what's going on with the Apostle Paul. Two years he's there before the events that we see in Acts 19 take place. Now remember carefully, I hope that you recall that Acts 8 opened up key Bible doctrines. It, it actually opened up 12 different areas of key Bible doctrines. We're obviously not going to cover those all tonight, but let me just remind you of it. Because in that context is where we see this spiritual warfare going on that reoccurs in Acts chapter 19. What do we see? 12 things. The composition of the church, the content of the gospel and the magnificence of the grace of God, the gift of evangelists, the purpose of the spiritual gifts, the spiritual gifts of healings and miracles, biblical demonology, witchcraft, and the many forms of the occult condemned by the scripture, God's choice of battlefields and spiritual warfare, the evident marks of salvation, the issue of falling away after salvation, chastening and sin in the life of the believer, the kingdom of God and the church, and the meaning and proper subjects of baptism. Twelve different things. We're certainly not going to cover that tonight. It took us many, many weeks to cover all that stuff. But we saw that there was a contrast between Stephen in Acts 7 and Philip in Acts chapter 8 that makes a lot of sense now when we get to Acts chapter 19. Philip was as successful in a different way than Stephen was successful, although there's some similarities. Stephen was an apologist. Paul's an apologist. Philip was an evangelist. Paul's an evangelist. Stephen was given the gift of miracles, supernatural powers, but he was killed. Philip performed supernatural miracles, casting out many demons and multiple healings, but he was not killed. Stephen faced evil Jewish leaders and false witnesses under the direct control of Satan himself. Philip faced a single evil Samaritan sorcerer and multiple people who were demon-possessed. <laughs> you get the idea that maybe the book of Acts is involved in spiritual warfare? I hope you do. We saw that there were three different words used for Stephen's supernatural gifts for which he was killed. There was the word translated power, that's dunamis. That's the dynamic power, explosive power, power capable of reproducing itself. It's actual irresistible power with a focus on the internal nature of the power, like life in the seed. And then we saw the word for wonders, terrace, which that's which causes amazement and wonder. The focus is on the effect of the mind of the person who sees the action performed. It shuts their mouths. It stops them dead in their tracks. Both those things are going on in Acts chapter 19. And then we saw miracles also in Acts 19, Semeon, a sign, that which authenticates the message of the messenger. That word is used 48 times in the Gospels of Christ's miracles. It's used to describe the eight messianic signs proving that Jesus is the Messiah in the Gospel of John. John never uses the word dunamis. He uses terrace only once, but he uses Semeon 17 times when speaking of the miracles of Christ. That is why Satan counterfeits the miraculous gifts. That's what Simon the sorcerer wanted to do. That's what the seven sons of Sceva in Acts 19 wanted 
to do. You see, he recognizes that these things authenticate a message. The Jewish synagogue had rejected the message of Paul, but they saw the power of Paul. The leader of the synagogue had seven sons. They said, you know, we don't like the message that he's preaching that Jesus is the Christ, but it seems to work on something where we can make some money. Be very careful. Because that's a temptation for people today, too. All of those words we saw occur in Hebrews 2, 3, and 4, which explains their purpose. What is the purpose of the signs and the miracles and the healings? Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So Jesus taught it. Then those who heard Jesus confirmed it. And God proved it true. Verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles, all three of those words, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, they're the spiritual gifts, the 22 spiritual gifts, according to his own will. Wow. Powerful verses there in Hebrews chapter 2. It ties it all together. It explains what's going on in the book of Acts. When you see the apostles and these first deacons working these supernatural miracles in the opening chapters of the book of Acts. It's a clear statement of the temporary nature also of the signed gifts during the apostolic period. I hope you picked that up. Those two verses there in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. The purpose of the gifts was for the bearing of a witness. It was prophesied by Christ in the Gospels, and that is key to answering the question tonight, can we cast out demons? Mark chapter 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following Amen. Now, what's the context of Acts chapter 16? It's a group of 11 scared disciples refusing to believe, hiding out in an upper room with the doors closed so that nobody can find them. And Jesus has to come in and bowl them out for their refusal to believe. They're going to be the apostles. They're going to be the ones that start the ball rolling. They're going to be the ones who, after Jesus ascends into heaven, have got to go out and preach, and they've got to stand in the temple, and they've got to face the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the high priests, and they've got to face the incredible opposition that we've seen as we've gone all the way through the book of Acts. Miraculous gifts were designed to authenticate the message of the apostles prior to the completion of the New Testament. You have to take those verses we just read in context. And they only refer in context to the apostles and to the apostolic period. In Mark, it's the apostles who have failed to believe the witness of the resurrection. Mark 16, verses 10 and following. She went in and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. That's verse 11. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went, that is the two on the road to Emmaus, those two went and told it unto the residue. That's the apostles. Neither believed they them. We've got multiple witnesses now who've come in and told the apostles, Christ is risen from the dead, and they refuse to believe. Verse 14. Afterward, he, that is Jesus, appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, now listen, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. <laughs> what have we been looking at in Acts chapter 19? Hardness of heart, unbelief. The word diverse in the Hebrews passage we looked at in Hebrews 2 just a moment ago, it means different kinds of miracles. Miracles are distinct from healings. 
They're mentioned in connection with Philip and in addition to other kinds of miracles. No healings are mentioned, by the way, in connection with Stephen. I don't know if you remember that, but Philip, yes, Stephen, no. We're not told all the different kinds of miracles that were in the days of the apostles, but they certainly included striking people dead, like Ananias and Sapphira, smiting people with blindness, like Elymas the sorcerer, Paul shaking off the poisonous snake into the fire, and so forth. You find a lot of things that are not healings that are called miracles in the New Testament. And of course, we saw the different kinds of miracles in the Old Testament. We've been looking at that in Exodus uh, in the morning services where we're going through the different plagues, the ten different plagues. The word for healings is not used of Stephen's miracles. They're used of the miracles of Christ. I'm going to skip over a bunch of things here. I'd like to get down a little further. In the apostolic period, preaching was always connected to healings and miracles. The word for preaching, euangelizo, the word from which we get our English word evangelize, to give good news, that's the root word for the gift of evangelist, which we've already studied. And we know that Philip, like Paul, had the gift of evangelist because of Acts 21. We haven't gotten there yet. It's two chapters away yet. But Acts 21, 8 specifically says so. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. So we pick up from Philip all the way back in Acts chapter 8, and we're going to see Philip again in Acts chapter 21. There is a unity and a cohesiveness to the book of Acts as you're moving through it. God doesn't just tell you a bunch of, you know, sporadic stories here and there that sort of, you know, are cool to read. He's trying to give you a message as you move through the book of Acts. It's an apostolic period. That's the reason that these things are going on. The gift of apostle is no longer being given today. So you do not expect to see today what you see in the book of Acts. And when you begin to see the kind of things in the book of Acts, you know it's got to come from one of three sources. And the source is not the Holy Spirit. When you begin to see those same kinds of things, you know that it either comes from the flesh. People can get emotionally so excited and involved that they have these rolling fits on the floor. That's flesh. It can come from the world. That's what we see some of these folks here in the book of Acts who are trying to, to imitate what Paul is doing or what the apostles in Acts chapter 8 were doing. And they want to pay money for it and they want to be able to have that kind of power. That's the world. You know, world trying to get in on it so that they can get some of the money. The third source, which is the dangerous one, and we see some manifestations of that both in Acts 8 and in Acts 19, is the devil. It's not the Holy Spirit, what you see today. Because the apostolic period is over. There were seven sign gifts. Fifteen gifts remain. Seven sign gifts were given during the period of time when the New Testament was being written. Apostle, prophets, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which was the reception of new special revelation. It's not the gift of wisdom. The gift of wisdom is listed among the spiritual gifts, and so is the gift of knowledge. They're different. Gift of knowledge was when people were getting brand new special revelation that had not been revealed in the Old Testament. It's one of the 17 different mysteries. Paul mentions that over in Acts chapter uh, 3. He tell, uh, not Acts, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3, which by the way, remember, we're at the church at Ephesus here in, in Acts chapter 19, where he talks about this new revelation which was not revealed unto, unto the prophets in the Old Testament as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. He calls those things mysteries. And as you trace the word mysteries through the New Testament, you find there are 17 different things that were not revealed in the Old Testament that are called mysteries in the New Testament. I don't want to preach that sermon tonight. And so we find here the same type of thing going on. Philip preached Christ unto them. They got, he got both carnal opposition and he got demonic opposition. The same thing is true in our text tonight in Acts chapter 19. When you preach Christ, there will be carnal opposition and there will be demonic opposition, even if it's not clearly evident on the surface like it was in the book of Acts. 
You know, today their church is trying everything else. But if you preach anything or anyone else, you know, you may get results, but it won't be God's results. Preaching sad stories, telling jokes, tickling people's ears with psychological drivel, teaching them how to shift the blame of their unkind mother or someone else will never produce revival. Philip and Paul in both these two chapters are preaching Christ, the Christ of Scripture, the Christ of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Philip preached Christ who forgives sinners, who rescues outcasts, and God brought revival. Never forget to preach Christ. The people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many with, taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Now we're not told exactly what specific healings took place with the Apostle Paul. It just says those who had these diseases got healed. We're told some of the specific diseases that got healed when we're looking here at, at Philip as he spoke you know the people were believing the message because it was authenticated by the signs but Simon the magician in Acts 8 and the seven sons of Sceva in Acts 19 missed the point they wanted to aggrandize themselves not point people to Christ that's a test that you can apply to all these faith healers today they want to be known as the big dudes they want to be known as the cool people. They want to be known as the people, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, don't applaud, just send money. If you'll send me some seed money showing your faith, that's what will heal you. <laughs> Folks, all you have to do is turn on charismatic TV and you'll see that all the time. That takes you to Acts 8 and Acts chapter 19. Those people don't know with whom they're dealing. They don't know the danger of what's going to happen to them. It certainly happened to the sons of Sceva. That kind of demonic activity and demon possession faced Philip at the Samaritan revival, as well as in Acts chapter 19. Notice something else. It's the same kind of immoral demons who were present when the sons of Sceva tried to cast out a demon in Acts 19. The demon stripped them naked. The man whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. He beat them up and ripped their clothes off. Look at the description in Acts chapter 8. Same thing's going on. It says, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. Notice something about that. The crowd contained many demon-possessed people. It was not a rare thing. And I think it is not a rare thing now based on the type of demons that possess those people. We'll see that in just a minute. Notice the demons are called unclean spirits. That's the word that translates the Greek word akathartos and comes from the root akatharsosis. It's used in the New Testament most frequently of lewdness and immoral purity motivated by demonic forces. Listen carefully. It's the same word that is used in Romans 1, 24 through 27, where it speaks of sodomy and lesbianism. And that is certainly viciously present today. I hope you've been paying attention to what's going on in our country with that most recent Supreme Court ruling. It wasn't rare back in Paul's day. It's not rare today. The gospel is what countered it, not political activity. People who had those unclean spirits who came under the sound of the gospel and who trusted Christ were the ones who were delivered. We are surrounded here in this town by the kind of people that Paul describes in Romans 1, 24 through 27. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 
For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Uncleanness. Unclean spirits are causing the activity that you see in Acts 8 and Acts 19. Unclean spirits are causing what you see in the United States of America today. That same word is used of habitual immorality. Romans 6, 9, 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. That's repeated habitual moral sin. Even so now yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. We talked about that this morning in the morning message, you recall. It's used the fornication and shameless nudity in 2 Corinthians 12, 20 and 21. The demons stripped them what? Naked. For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you as I would, but that I, I shall be found unto you as such you would not. There will be debates, envyings, wrath, strife, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults. And lest when I come my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many of which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. In Galatians 5, it's listed first with adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, and the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In Ephesians 4.19, it's portrayed as brainless, unfeeling, greedy, passionate immorality. This I say, therefore. Remember, Paul is at Ephesus in Acts 19. And testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened. Here's this brainless, unfeeling, greedy immorality. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. He's writing to believers and saying, don't be like those pagans because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, they've had their consciences seared, as Peter says, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. They can hardly wait to get involved in immorality. And by the way, you probably picked up on the fact that in the past I've talked about how greed is connected to immorality and uncleanness in the Bible because there's a lot of money to be made in it. And, of course, pornography is one of the largest grossing non-taxed businesses in the world today. Ephesians 5, one chapter later. Remember, we're at Ephesus in Acts 19. It's classified with fornication, covetousness, idolatry, obscenity, and whoremongers. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Neither filthiness, iscrotes, shamefulness, obscenity, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, we're not talking about people who fail to take baths. It's the unclean demons that we've been talking about in Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 8. Nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful workness of darkness, but rather reprove them. In Colossians 3, it's again connected to fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. I won't read the whole passage. I'm just giving it to you. In 1 Thessalonians, do you think God has a point in having it in all these books of the New Testament? It's not just mentioned in Acts. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, it's connected to the type of preaching that Paul did. It's not connected, contrasted. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, there's a description of moral sin called uncleanness and contrasted with holiness. 
Abstain from fornication, he says in verse 3. Verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence, that's epithumia, that's hot passions. Lust that's forbidden. Verse 7, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And then verse 8, we need to pay attention to it because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God if you're a believer. He therefore that despises, okay? You say, I don't want to have to listen to that stuff. I can dabble with it a little bit. He therefore that despiseth, remember this brings us back to Samuel in the Old Testament. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. There are the unclean spirits. There is the Holy Spirit. There are men who obey God almost, like Saul in the Old Testament. And Samuel said to him, Stubbornness rebellion is like iniquity and idolatry. Iniquity is moral impurity. You stubborn? You're going to obey God, but not in everything. You got your own thing you want to do. Put you into that category that's now being described by Paul in the New Testament connected with unclean spirits. And where did Saul end up? He ended up going to a witch who had a familiar spirit. Folks, that's serious business. You better not be dabbling in anything occultic or you are in serious trouble with God. I hope you're getting the point that trying to cast out demons without authority to do so puts you in a very dangerous category, especially unclean demons. 2 Peter 2, 9 and 10, uncleanness is one of the main character markers of apostates. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly, means first and foremost, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. New Testament has a lot to say about this. And the apostates, think charismatic TV, who are involved in all of this kind of activity, are like the seven sons of Sceva, who happen to run into a guy who's got an unclean spirit, who delights to rip their clothes off and kick them out of the house naked. Revelation 16, 12 through 14, it's unclean spirits that work miracles and control the world during the tribulation. Lewd immorality will be one of the key hallmarks of the tribulation period. Six angels poured out his vial on the Euphrates. It's dried up, so it makes way for the king of the east. And then in verse 13 it says, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Takes us back to Acts. Which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them unto the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. Unclean spirits will be confined to the fallen Babylon. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is the greatest fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Our time is up, but the same demonically motivated sexual impurity is seen repeatedly in the Gospels where Christ casts out unclean demons. For example, the nudist Gadarene demoniac who wore no clothing. Nudism is a manifestation of a cellular lasciviousness, uninhibited shamelessness, a mark of demonism, and that has crept into the church today, particularly in girls' and women's clothing styles, but also in the body decorations, the body revealing clothing of boys and men. Christians should always be aware of that dangerous trend and stay as far away from it as possible. There was a nudist demoniac in Luke 8, 27. I'm going to have to stop, but I'll read you this one verse. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. And when that guy got saved, notice what happened. 
Verse 35, then went out to see what was done, and they came to, came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were deported, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Well, I got to page 14 <laughs> out of 22. The New Testament has a lot to say about this subject, folks. I hope you're paying attention. Don't think, well, yeah, but this is the church. This is a fundamental church. This is a church started by that great fundamentalist preacher, Dr. Carl McIntyre. Just remember, demon-possessed pos pe people also show up in religious settings. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Wilt thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. Now look at verse 26. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this thing? What new doctrine is this? For with authority... You don't have this authority. Jesus had it. Paul had it. The apostles had it. For with this authority, with authority, he commandeth even the unclean spirits. Not some other spirits. It's the unclean spirits to come out and they do obey him. Well, we're going to have to close at that point. And the Lord willing, continue next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It warns us of the spiritual warfare. There will indeed be carnal opposition. But as we move forward in the, the battle to which you have called us, there will not merely be carnal opposition, there will be demonic opposition. There will be opposition from those who are involved in unclean spirits. And we perceive that from Romans chapter 1, demonic opposition from those who are involved in sodomy and lesbianism. We see it happening today in America. Father, make us wise as serpents, harmless as doves, faithful to you, understanding that it is only the gospel of Christ reaching the hearts of these people that can ever turn them aside from the degenerate, filthy darkness into which they have plunged themselves. Only the gospel of Christ, the light of the good news, can reach into that darkness and draw them out. Father, again, we thank you for the text that we've studied tonight. We pray for your blessings to our hearts as we apply it and as we seek to live in a way that perfectly glorifies Christ, avoiding all those things that are unclean not merely ritually unclean, things that are morally unclean, so that Jesus Christ might in us be glorified. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is hymn number 674, 674.